Well, it wouldn't be a social media thing if I didn't take a Twitter picture. <laughs> okay. Make sure you all follow me at Messina2012 and send this to hashtag zero by 2020, zero X 2020. Thank you, Joe, uh, and again, happy birthday yesterday. Got a chance to have dinner with Joe yesterday, and Joe's amazingly good looking for 29 years old. Joe, congrats. <laughs> um, I also wanted to uh, say that one of the true heroes of healthcare is here. When my generation's done talking about healthcare, uh, Jeremy Hunt will be at the top of the heroes of healthcare. And so I wanted to, for the bottom, congratulations. <laughs> So I love the fact that from the very beginning, this has been called the patient safety movement. It's not called a company or a patient safety club or an association. It's called a movement, right? And it's called a movement because movements change the world. Grassroots movements stopped slavery in the United States. It was a movement that gave women suffrage. It was uh, we, a movement ended apartheid in South Africa and stopped gun killings in Australia. You know, my hero, Margaret Mead, said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world, because indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And that's why it's so apropos that this is the patient safety movement. It really is a movement of people like all of you and people on uh, video right now and online who have one by one helped change the world. And today, you know, people think that movements are about marches and cool signs and hippie dresses and, you know, all those fun things. But instead, movements happen all the time in a very, very different place called social media. And every single day, people are organizing themselves online in a way that they used to do on the streets. And to really be a true movement, we have to be part of that too. So I'm gonna talk about how to use social media to continue to grow this movement uh, everywhere in every way. But first I wanna start with a story about how a movement changed the world. When Barack Obama started running for president, he was at 3% in the polls and no one thought he could win. And on his very first day in office, we huddled in his brand new Oval Office to figure out which issues to, to tackle first. And we had this great debate and fight about which issues. The economy was cleaving off. We just passed an economic stimulus bill to save the economy that morning. Education system was broken. We had environmental issues. We had energy issues. And we went around the room each talking about what the safe political thing to do was. And finally, President Obama stood up on his second hour as president and said, Every single one of you in this room knows that healthcare is the right thing to do. But every single one of you is afraid of it because it has stopped 10 presidents in a row. And no one thinks we can get it done. And he said, remember when all of you in the room told me I couldn't be the president and I'd lose? He's like, we're gonna do healthcare and we're gonna get it done. And in the next 14 months, I went into the Oval Office five times to tell him that healthcare was dead. We didn't have the votes, we lost the vote, it was dead five times. And five times in a row, he said to me, look it, this is a movement, and people are either gonna want this or not. Put me back on television, put me in front of the American people, and let's figure out whether they wanna fight for it. And 14 months after we started trying, after 78 years of attempting to pass a universal health care bill in the United States, Barack Obama put his name on the signature piece of legislation that will define his generation. <laughs> Similarly, when I was a new board member of the patient safety movement, we had this first debate, and I love a good debate, and uh, we had this debate about what the goal should be. And our visionary leader, Joe Kiani, said it should be zero. The goal should be zero. And everyone in the room, including me, said, oh, Joe, silly Joe, come on, there's no way to do that. We need something we can have a party to say we got to, like 100,000 a deaths or 50,000 deaths so we can have a press conference and say we won. And Joe said, well, then Jim, you're saying that any death is okay. And I said, that's a really interesting point. And he said, you know, aren't we really going to go for zero? Isn't the goal to save every life? And 
that's a great idea. And great ideas foster great movements. And this is a movement. And to, to be part of that movement now, we have to fight for it. We have to advocate for it. Because every single day, people are having a discussion online about the priorities of their countries, of the world, of their leaders. And either we're part of that discussion or we're gonna get left behind. So we're gonna have a little slideshow and see if this works. Yes, we're moving forward. A reminder that the world is now on social media. 1.37 billion people are on Facebook. 500, 330 million people are on Twitter, including one in four people who have a political discussion every day on Twitter. 800 million people follow uh, are on Instagram, showing pictures, telling the story of their lives. And now a company that didn't exist five years ago, now every single one of your kids is on Snapchat. Snapchat is now the fastest growing platform in the world. And so people come up to me, and when I advise presidents and prime ministers, they come up to me and say, Jim, I need a Facebook strategy. I need a Twitter strategy. And I said, no, you need a message. You need a story. You need a vision for where you want to take the country. Because a reminder that platforms are always changing. You know, Joe and I are old, and I still have an AOL email address. Uh, Jim is seen at AOL, if anyone wants to email me, because um, it's cool. I'm the only one I know who still has one. Uh, remember Napster? Doesn't exist as a company anymore. Everyone used to want to be on Napster. Facebook then launched, then Google. Remember Google was just a search engine before it became the most profitable ad uh, platform in the world. Twitter exploded, and then Snapchat came. So the platforms are always going to change. I want you to care a little bit less about the platforms. What I want you to understand is you have to engage somewhere. In the old days, when you know there was only cart and horses and no electricity when Joe and I were born, um, people had political conversations in their backyards. People had them at festivals and at soccer matches and with their neighbors. Now. People all the time say, oh, I don't know about social media. What's really happening? Is it fake news? What's going on? I need you to remember that it's the same conversation we've been having for 2,000 years. It's just in a different place. It's just people who are connecting with each other to share their vision, to share their values, to share some sort of connection. So the patient safety online conversation is going on every single day. And as a little birthday present to Joe, we spent the last couple months doing the largest ever patient safety social listening project ever done. We went and analyzed every tweet, Facebook post, Instagram, et cetera, by continent to look and see where, what people are talking about patient safety. There's good news and there's bad news here. There's a lot of bad news if you're, if you're uh, wanting to be a PR specialist in healthcare. Um, but it is an honest discussion going on. So I'm gonna start with the United States and America. The United States by far has the biggest volume, um, mostly because of the political questions about the healthcare system. The interesting thing I want you to focus on though is patient safety. So this is called a topic wheel. The things inside the topic wheel in the big letters are the most talked about. I'm a little confused why drunk driving is a patient safety issue, but people believe it is. Inside patient safety, though, medical errors is one of the five. Medical errors is also in healthcare. Think about healthcare in the United States. The most political issue in the world in the United States is healthcare. But one of the five biggest topics inside of healthcare is medical errors. If you're a hospital, one of the, the five biggest is hospital death and medical errors. So these conversations are happening. These are organic conversations. No paid ads are here. This is just what people are talking about. The other interesting thing is 45% of the conversation is basically negative. Only 5% is positive. We're having all these amazing moments of having these big commitments and other things, and people aren't understanding it. Things only move if they see them negatively. And that's a reminder to all of us to tell the stories. Like many of you, I was crying like a baby this morning when Alicia Cole talked about her story. And those kind of stories, she's one of the best fighters I've ever seen. 
And right now it's a topic about negativity. And we need to remember that this is also about progress, especially in the medical community where you're all doing these amazing things. Now, I want to go to the great United Kingdom that Minister Hunt is. Uh, I thought it was interesting, Jeremy, that you're one of the five big topics, um, which <laughs> for your future political career is good news. <laughs> um, uh, inside NHS, however, NHS has trust, funding, you, you know all this. The interesting thing is the UK debate is intrinsically more political around the NHS. Um, the Dr. Baba Garber uh, Garba, uh, uh, conviction was the biggest driver of things, the flu epidemic being the second biggest. Um, interestingly, in the UK, more positive conversations than negative. Um, interestingly enough, it's the only country we looked at that was more positive than negative. Uh, and in part, I think it's because you have an amazing health minister and he just does a great job. Um, this is Spain, a country I operate in. Uh, it's, this is obviously in Spanish. The most common hashtag was SEGPAC, which means patient safety. 1,100 different posts about patient safety. This term was not only being understood by patients, but interestingly, Spain, unlike every other country, the medical community and the hospitals have adopted this hashtag. Uh, and the tweets are from doctors and hospitals talking about their work to be uh, to be have healthy patients and, and to move safety forward. So in Spain, unlike other places, the medical community has gone and taken the offensive and not just played defensive and had a big explosion uh, in positive uh, things. Um, this is all of Europe together. So this is an interesting, Europe has the second least amount of conversation of all the continents we looked at. Most of it is around academia and conferences, similar to our conference, which is why you should all use the hashtag. Uh, to make sure people are moving. I pulled out a couple different tweets that are interesting. Things are moving all over the place. Almost no positivity outside the United Kingdom and a little bit of Spain. There's more work to do to make sure we're telling the story of why these things are so important. In Asia, Asia, this is interesting. Um, look at the number one most driven tweet about huge drops in deaths at one hospital from 5,000 to 1,317. That is an amazing statistic that moved online. The other interesting thing is in Asia, there's almost no positive discussion of medical safety and medical errors. There it is a place, you know, this town called Gorakhpur has had unbelievable problems. And if you look at the wheel, well-kept secret is the hashtag that people on their own generically started to talk about all their friends and family members dying in hospitals. It's called the well-kept secret movement and it started on the grassroots, on the streets. And so as a reminder that if we don't provide information, if we don't go advocate, people are gonna do it on their own. And that kind of information is something that people will, will want to get out. And I thought this tweet was pretty interesting. Look at the very bottom. Hope media will highlight the facts. You know, they're pushing to get their own coverage because the only place they can find this stuff is on social media. Um, South America is almost, uh, it's very interesting that South America is by far the smallest conversation going on with the occasional fact and, and argument. Um, there's not a lot of stuff moving. Patient safety is one of the big five issues, interestingly enough. Uh, unsurprisingly enough, almost all of it's negative in the patient safety. Maybe, Joe, next time we'll go to Argentina or Mexico or, you know, somewhere down there. This is very little discussion going on. In the past six months, only 1,900 posts, and people are organizing themselves on their own right now. Uh, patient safety in Spanish, for those of our South American friends, I wanted to also run this. Uh, see a very similar uh, similar thing. I think the interesting thing here is patient safety is the number one term in the topic wheel, driven by no one, dri just driven generically by people talking about patient safety and looking for answers online. 
And in a world of fake news and difficult to find information, it is a reminder that every single day, people are asking on the internet for help. They're asking for ways to make a difference. They're saying, what are you hearing? And this is happening all over the world. So after this, how can we tell our story, right? Because every single one of you in this room is doing something unbelievable to move, to advance this movement. And you're doing things that are just unprecedented. And we gotta tell that story. I wanna remind you that everyone talks about big data, right? Um, in politics, I'm known as the big data guy because I love data and I hate polls and I think everything should be data. It's why I, I, maybe I'm a medical professional because I believe data should drive everything, right? But the era of big data is over. We're now in little data. And what I mean by little data is personalized data. Every single thing people want now is personalized. When there was this amazing study done about the two most important things in people's lives all over the world. And you know, I, I thought for sure the answers to those two questions would be money and sex, right? Because I thought it's kind of an American thing to think. Turns out it was religion and the cell phone. The two most important things people had to have were religion and the cell phone. And so if you think about this, what you, why you have this, why you have a smartphone in your pocket, is you want personalized. You want it to be what you want when you want it. So everything you do in healthcare, and healthcare is the most difficult thing to do that in, has to be accessible on this. It has to be easy enough to read on this. Part of the challenge, uh, I don't know if you all were here this morning, there's this amazing woman from, I think, Finland, or, or this great doctor who talked about communication. And I wanted to go up and be like, yes! And this is so true because so much of it's so complex. It needs to be easy. It needs to be understand here. One of the great things that Joe has done is build apps for patient safety. And when my mother got sick earlier this year, I pulled the app up and said, okay, you're going to the hospital. Joe told me to look this stuff up. I got to help you be an advocate, right? It was all on here. It made it easy. It wasn't some scary thing. The other thing is the most important people in the world are your friends and family. Barack Obama went from zero to President of the United States because we built neighborhood teams. This weekend, when you decide which movie to go to, you're gonna decide because something you read online. You're gonna say, Joe and I are always on email or so Facebook together. Joe's gonna say, oh, Jim, I saw the new Black Panther movie. And I'll say to my wife, Taya, Joe saw it, said it was great, right? When you're all shopping, you go on Amazon. Why do you go on Amazon? Because it's really easy and you know what your friends and, and uh, family members have bought. So to think about, in a political context, in campaigns, all you really have to do is get your supporters to talk to their friends and ask their friends to talk to their friends. That's how you win national campaigns. It's the same in healthcare. You've gotta start sharing your stories, and I think Patient Safety Movement's done an amazing job about this, creating content to get out to people and start talking about these stories. The other thing I wanted to remind you is the ladder of engagement. This is a very uh, thing that I show every single campaign I work on because it's a reminder that people don't show up one day and say, I wanna be a patient safety advocate. Instead, they say to themselves very early, do I care about this issue? Do I have a preference? Because there's a million issues, right? In fact, interestingly enough, people give your kids grief about being the generation that just spends all their time on their phones, right? Under 29 year old kids from 13 to 29 are the most politically active generation in the history. They're four times as more politically active than any of their parents. They just do all of it online. And so we're competing in the online space for people to actually care about our issue. And then second, appreciation, desire to work for our issue. Why should they help? Why should they be part of this patient safety movement? And then third, after they figure that out, familiarity. Can they actually talk about the issue? Have we given them information? As you as medical professionals, have you given them enough to go advocate in the workplace with their friends, with their families about why these are so important? And then fourth, finally, after all three of those, and this is true with everything, it's how you get people to go buy Coca-Cola, it's how Uber gets people to drive in there, it's how Barack Obama became president. You gotta move people through these four steps. 
And the final step is awareness. I want to take this and I want to be an advocate for the issue. You can't just expect people are going to show up and do this. You have to work them down the ladder of engagement. And that is how, in the end, they will be part of this movement. I also want to remind you that this is not just me up here saying this. The grassroots world of politics and grassroots has changed everything in the last 10 years, including there's two recent examples I pulled. The Women's March started out as an email and is now the most powerful political movement of our lifetime, happening all over the world. In Europe, people started doing protest movements, founded their own party, and they are currently leading in the polls right before the election. This stuff is all happening online. You know, the Arab Spring is another example. Barack Obama is another example. All of these things are happening online, and it's people organizing themselves. And so we have to decide whether or not we're going to be a part of this. Because in the old days, people just bought a bunch of boring TV ads, and it was enough, right? Now, I have commercial clients who refuse to buy one television ad because it's useless. They just go right online and have a conversation because people are out there trying every single day. So this is the future. This is what we want. This is who we are. Zero deaths, because that's the right thing to do for the world. It's the right thing to do for everyone in this room. It's why we started a movement. And it's a reminder in the end that movements are fundamentally about organizing. They are about getting more people involved. We call it the snowflake in politics. You start out small and then roll the snowflake, then you got a little ball, then you roll the ball down the hill and suddenly you've got a bigger snowball. And then at the end you have a really nice three layered snowman that your brother or sister comes and beats with a bat and breaks it right after you get done, right? That movement is how politics gets done. And most of it is happening online. And if we, if we are part of that discussion, and I think I've showed you recently in our, in our uh, social listening exercises that right now we have some more work to do. We have some more work to do to talk about the positive things. And we have more work to do inside the movement, inside the healthcare community, with starting to talk about the things we're doing. Because right now, it's one thing to be part of this great thing that we're doing. And we're making commitments in this room today that are going to change the world. But we have to bring more people in. And if we do that, we'll change the world. And if we do that, we'll get to hug and celebrate like the president and I did on election night. This is my sop to Joe because Joe loves this photo. Um, and a reminder that we all win. So um, thank you very, very Right. Um, thank you very, very much for listening to me ramble about something I obviously believe very deeply in. Uh, and if you don't, do a Facebook uh, post today or a tweet or, or email your entire list. Joe says you cannot eat dinner. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.